Since 1972, women in particular have gotten progressively less happy. Even though the feminist movement has been successful, it's been triumphant, women have so many more choices, and they do, but do they have more security? Do they have more love? Do they have more tenderness in their lives? Do they feel like they have a good balance between career and family? I don't think the answer to any of those is yes. Welcome to To The Contrary. I'm Bonnie Urbe. This week, Sex Matters. That's the title of conservative columnist Mona Charon's new book. In it, she argues that modern feminism has lost touch with science, love, and common sense. Welcome, Mona. Great Thanks. to see you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's, we, we want to get to your, uh, the, where you find yourself with other Republicans at this point in time, but I want to start okay. with the book, which is mainly what we want to talk about. Sure. So feminism, um, one thing that really interested me was you say that it's lost touch with science. Mm -hmm. How does that work? So I go back and I look through the writings of the major second wave feminists. I also looked at the first wave, who is usually considered to be the suffragist movement. Um, but the second wave is the one that most people think of when you use the term feminist, you know, Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem and Germaine Greer and all of those people. And I went back and reread them. I, some of them I had, was reading for the first time. And um, it was striking how out of touch they were then with the science. Namely, they really did advance the idea that there were no differences other than anatomical ones between men and women. They insisted that we were just alike. And um, this has been really clearly disproven in the intervening decades. Well, that's what I was going to say. It is, it, that's been disproven, but not a whole lot was known about the function of hormones exactly uh, back in the 60s and 70s. That is true. Hor there's been a lot of study of hormones. There's been a lot of study of brain imaging. Uh, we now know that women's and men's brains are differently organized. Um, men, you know, when you hear about men having more compartmentalized brains, it's true. Women use more of their brains for tasks um, and men use specific regions. So there's some interesting studies that found that people who had an injury to a particular spot in the brain, the men who got this particular injury in this particular spot lost all of their spatial relations skills. But the women who had the identical injury did not, because women use more of their brains for spatial relations than men do. So little things like that. Um, then there were big things, like um, the data that show that even days after birth, infant baby girls re react differently to stimuli than infant baby boys. It's too soon for these noticeable differences to be socially constructed, so they must be kind of built in, hardwired, as we say in the computer age. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show was that the feminists really were not in touch with the science. And there's a lot of denial. Uh, I quote a number of researchers who said, I wanted to study sex differences, specifically sex differences in the brain, and I was warned off it by colleagues who said, that's a career ender, don't do it. Um, it was just considered radioactive. Um, and, um, and my point is that, yes, they lost touch with science, and they really needn't have been... I understand the feminist reluctance, right? They were worried that if you looked at certain scientific data that suggested, for example, that boys outstrip girls in high-end mathematical and scientific ability, which is true, um, just as females outstrip males in high-end verbal ability, um, but that if you talk about those things, that some poorly motivated people, people in bad faith, will use these differences to suggest that women are inferior to men. And that's what they're worried about. But I think we're mature but you, enough. But are you talking about, for example, like Andrea uh, Dworkin, I think was her last name, and some of those early feminist scholars who were, you know, they were angry. They were at that time revolting against a situation where the New York Times until 1972 ran ads saying men wanted, help wanted female and male. Right. So there were jobs that in and, print you and were you not know, allowed to go for. And, and so, I 
think the feminists did some good things. I'm not going to deny that for a second. There were some good things. That's one of them. You know, there is no reason you have to sex segregate the help wanted ads. Um, there were other things. I think the introduction of the term Ms. was helpful. Why should you have to identify your marital status on an employment form or any other form? So that's good. Um, and there were even more substantive things like um, reforming the way women who testified against their rapists were treated by the criminal justice system, where it was no longer, it became unacceptable to sort of try to impeach a woman who was the accuser by saying that she hadn't le lived a perfectly chaste life. So those are good advances and I, I applaud them. Um, unfortunately, the feminists went way beyond that. They did some things that I think have been extremely damaging. Um, they, um, they embraced the sexual revolution, which was completely unnecessary for the advancement of women. Arguably, it was harmful to women. Um, and they rejected the family uh, and marriage and the family as a trap for women. They interpreted it as something that had been designed for the benefit of men and that women couldn't be their best selves, they couldn't self-actualize unless they were willing to leave all that behind. And in fact, Jermaine Greer even talked about, she didn't have children, but she talked about, you know, actually encouraging women to actually leave their kids, their, their actual living children behind in order to, uh, in order to uh, follow their own drummer. And um, I think that's been very, very damaging for, for women. It's also been damaging for men and children. But for women in particular, because by the nature of femininity, women tend to really want and need security. And marriage tends to provide that. Okay, but I wonder whether, um, are you, t is that what feminists are writing today? Um, yeah. Today, oh, yeah. they're still saying family, the, the I you mean, know, has they, Gloria they Steinem will, ever they'll, written they'll, that? Has, they'll give lip has service. Has Rebecca Traister written give, that? Have, they'll give lip service to the idea that they approve all choices. But then they'll also say things like, um, they're trying to force us into heteronormative sex. And that's, you know, a, a trap. And that's a, uh, a prison. Um, they, uh, you know, they, they believe that for a woman to be promiscuous is some sort of a victory for the sisterhood. Still, name yeah. somebody who's saying that uh, now. The, the website feministing.com, mm -hmm. um, uh, Jessica Valenti, what did she say? I quote her in the book, a um, um, number of others. They also are big, you know, very enthusiastic cheerleaders for women being single mothers. And they say this is, again, empowerment. Well, it's not. I mean, some single mothers do a great job not denying that, but I think the, the, the data are incontrovertible that it's not good for kids, it's exhausting and not good for mothers uh, to try to raise kids on their own. And to be um, promoting this as a form of liberation is a, is a lie. Well, that I will, uh, I will say that, you know, that I see all over the place. Um, and I'm kind of surprised that conservatives out, aren't, out there more condemning societal acceptance of single motherhood. Why aren't conservative women out there doing that? I mean, they would, get, because they would get pounced. They'll on. get pounded, right, exactly. <laughs> um, but they will also get pounded by a lot of other conservatives who say, you know, I have a gay son and he's married and uh, and and you're you're opposing marriage and, and all that I have, sort of and thing. And I'm divorced and my you know daughter is shacking up with her boyfriend and yeah. Um, that's the reason, is that um, these things which began arguably on the left have just become the mainstream culture. What was the counterculture is now the culture. And even though, um, even though there's abundant evidence that it's harmful and that we're not as happy as we used to be, um, you know, there's a thing called the General Social Survey, which has been done every two years since 1972, and there are a whole bunch of other surveys of the developed world um, asking people how happy they are. Now, of course, that's a big topic and, you know, you have to be a little bit cautious about reading too much into it. But I do think it's interesting that since 1972, women in particular have gotten progressively less happy. Even though the feminist movement has been successful, it's been triumphant, women have so many more choices, and they do. But do they have more security? Do they have more love? Do they have more tenderness in their lives? Do they feel like they have a good balance between career and family? I don't think the answer to any of those is yes.
you spend a lot of time in the book talking about f blaming feminism for the breakup of the traditional family. But what a lot of people would argue is that there's a new family. There are new definitions of family, and they include not just blood relatives, but close friends. That a lot of uh, couples who are parenting together and cohabiting, but not getting married, are counted, and eventually a lot of those end up married. Mm. So, not so many, um, actually. Uh, well, yeah. well t talk not about so that. Not so many. But, so, but also, but. So are you saying the new definition of family is deleterious to society? I am. Um, look, I mean, I have friends who are gay parents, and, you know, I've said to them, look, you know, you just have to make a little bit of an extra effort to make sure that for this child, who, like if it's two women, make sure that little boy or girl has a male in their life. You know, it's, it's really important. Um, not ideal not to have the father there, but if you are a gay couple, then you have to go out of your way to make sure they get the input. Um, so, you know, th but, but, um, you know, the, um, the basics of human life, the basics of human attachment have not changed. This is human nature. We all tend to care the most about our biological relatives. Um, and I say this as somebody who has one adopted child, so I realize that it's not like a hard and fast rule. It's not like you can't love somebody you're not a blood relation to. But in general, um, that's the way human beings are made. And um, I think it was um, Adam Smith who said uh, that it, it's troubling to think that um, that I care more about you know losing my little finger than if 10,000 people die in a Lisbon earthquake. Um, that's just the way we are. And um, so I think it's just unrealistic to imagine that these casual relationships where it's friendship and it's, uh, whatever, and we're not going to call it marriage, we're not going to call it a family, we're just going to, love is all that matters. I mean, that's what I call the, the love is all you need uh, argument. And I go through and show that, first of all, these relationships tend to break up at a much, much higher rate than marriages do. Um, and, um, and that's really hard on the children. Uh, it's hard on the couples, but it's also You're talking really hard heterosexual on the or I am talking or, I am talking about heterosexuals, but it's also true of gay couples uh, where the uh, where living together uh, is much less stable. Of course, there aren't that many numbers for gays because there hasn't been legal gay marriage for long enough for us to really look at it carefully. Um, but the data are incontrovertible about um, heterosexual couples that don't marry. So um, the, the children who are born to a union where the parents are not married, um, I have the data in the book, but it's some huge percentage of them will see that relationship, their parents' relationship, break up by the time they're five years old. And um, very often what happens is then they'll stay with their mother, mother brings in a boyfriend, uh, and then that's their new dad, except that he's not married either, and he doesn't adopt the children, and doesn't want the children, he wants the mother, and it can lead to, it's the, like the, the rates of um, emotional difficulties for kids in those kinds of set situations are extremely high, very, very worrisome, and the levels of abuse, both physical abuse and sexual abuse, of children living in a home with their biological mother and a non-related father are unbelievably high compared to those who live with their biological dad. Um, all kinds and yet, of problems. But I've also seen studies um, that came out when um, gay parenting first became more public, like within the last decade or two, saying that uh, children of gay unions are happier because they get more attention well, from that, both parents that may be, look, because they're they're cherished more. It's, it's early days, and what? let's wait and see. I saw the same argument that was made about adopted children, um, that they were happier because they were wanted by both parties and so forth. Um, it turns out that's actually not quite true. Um, adopted kids have more issues. They tend to have more psychological problems be, for understandable reasons. They have to cope with have, the sense that their real parents didn't, their biological parents, I should say, didn't didn't uh, want them or couldn't take care of them, and you know that's something they have to work through. But um, I would just hold off. Let's just wait and see with uh, with gay couples. But in any case, it's a tiny percentage of the population, and what happens with gay couples is really a side 
show um, because the important thing is how are the vast majority of parents behaving and those the vast majority are heterosexuals. And um, so here's a funny thing. Um, the people in the upper third of our society, the college educated people, are living pretty much the way they did, almost the way they did in the 1950s. They have, you know, after a little flirtation with high divorce rates that peaked in 1990, they are um, getting married, staying married, raising kids together. They, they do not have children before they get married, and um, they're, they're very stable lives for those kids. Those kids are the most privileged children in America because they have very, very stable lives. For the bottom two-thirds, and especially for people with only a high school degree or less, marriage is no longer the norm at all. And it is, um, it is a, a kind of a dead end if you are born to a single high school educated gal in America. Um, your, your chances of coming out of poverty are, are very, very slim. Marriage is key. Marriage is key to success. I mean, there's something that the sociologists call the success sequence, right, which is get your education, get married, and have children in that order. And the upper third of our society is following it, and the rest are not. And, you know, why are they keeping this a secret from people who need it the most? You know, the people at the bottom are the ones who need the support and stability of family the most. Millennials and younger people are seeing gender as a spectrum. They don't yeah. see it as boy, girl anymore. And you write about that in the book. What do you, I do. What do you think about it? Look, I have an open mind. Um, maybe it's true that... Uh, uh, that you can have a male brain inside of a female body and vice versa. Um, though you'll notice that now they're recognizing that there is such a thing as a male brain and a female brain, which they spent decades denying. <laughs> but now they say, oh, no, no, you can. All right. Um, look, my feeling is we are rushing pell-mell into doing some incredibly dangerous interventions with children about their sexual identity before we have any idea what we're doing. It's a fad, and it's worry, really worrisome. Look, if an adult wants to change their body and their name and take hormones for the rest of their lives, that's fine. It's a free country. You can do what you want. But to take little kids who, as we all know, go through stages in life and encourage them, really outright encourage them to believe that they are transgender because they say they want to be the other sex at a very tender age, and I'd say this as somebody who was like that myself as a little kid. I had two older brothers. A lot of the kids in the neighborhood were boys. I wanted to be a boy. And I said I wanted everyone to call me Timmy. And I didn't like dresses. And I played with trucks. Now, imagine, I mean, my parents understood this was a phase. <laughs> they didn't call me Timmy. <laughs> but imagine if that child you know, were to present today. Um, they might easily be told by the school psychologist and by the teachers that if the parents didn't ratify the child's identity, that the child was going to become suicidal and depressed and so on. And so, you know, I, I'm asking for a rule of reason. There is no data that I've been able to find that there is any truth to the idea that there is a male brain in a female body and vice versa. As far as I can tell, it's speculative. Now, it may be true. But before we start experimenting on children and putting them on hormone-blocking drugs, and by the way, 80 to 85% of children who express feelings of gender dysphoria outgrow it when they go through puberty. But the problem with the treatment model now is they give them puberty-blocking hormones. And so the child doesn't get the opportunity then to have the natural maturation that might clarify their self, you know, their identity. Um, and further, it has physical effects. You know, boys who are given female hormones or, hormo or puberty-blocking hormones don't develop the musculature um, and the bone size and strength of a normal male. And, uh, you know, these things are irreversible as far as we, I mean, we don't know for sure because it's been too soon, but are very possibly irreversible. And then what is the effect of giving people hormone, cross-hormone treatment for the rest of their lives? Um, we don't know. 
Uh, will it, you know, predispose them to cancer, heart disease? We don't know. So I'm just pleading for not seeing this as another opportunity to pat ourselves on the back for how enlightened we are, um, but rather to be cautious and say, we don't know what we're doing, so slow down. Before we run out of time, I want to ask you about your appearance at the conservative uh, PAC group in March. You uh, came out very forcibly against the president, and you got a pretty nasty um, pushback from other conservatives. Tell me, why don't you like Trump? Um, I should say, in fairness to that audience at CPAC, that I got a some applause as well and some support. It wasn't unanimous at all. Um, but uh, look, uh, the party is, uh, the, the Republican Party is becoming very Trumpified now. And uh, people who, um, who protest and stand up on their hind legs and say this is unacceptable. And we, would, we said it was unacceptable when Bill Clinton was acting uh, like a predator. And we say it's un unacceptable when Trump is doing it. And we cannot let the R or the D after the politician's name affect our principles and what we think is right and wrong. Um, so, um, so I am not, uh, I, I'm dismayed by Trump and everything he is and, and everything he is doing. Uh, and the, I'm even more disheartened to see how willingly the Republican Party has just folded uh, to him and become basically a cult of personality. So are you not calling yourself a Republican not anymore? Really, uh, I'm not sure about that. Get back to me in a few weeks. <laughs> well, but tell me, um, you have had a lot of nasty response from conservatives. How does it make you feel when you say these are the people whom, you know, whose world I feel I have been inhabiting and improving, yay, these many decades as a conservative columnist, and now they're turning on you? Yeah. Well, it is, uh, it's been disorienting. And it's, uh, it's been very tough, I have to confess. I mean, I'm not enjoying this. Um, but, um, you know, people who uh, expect me to go along, and they do, um, they expect me to get in line as if being a columnist or an opinion person somehow means you're on a team. And I've never conceived of myself that way. And I've written columns saying, you know, throughout my years of writing, and I've been writing a column for 30 years now, um, I was critical of George H.W. Bush, who was the first president who was in office when I started. Um, I've been critical of other Republican presidents. I was one of the people who formed an organization to try to prevent Harriet Myers from being confirmed for the Supreme Court under the George W. Bush administration, though I liked W. in many ways. But funny, I just thought it was my uh, obligation to call them as I saw them. And everybody else thought that, too. I got no pushback from conservatives when I took those positions. There was no cult of personality around previous Republican presidents. There was no sense that you had to be um, a loyal soldier. Um, on the contrary, you were given credit for being principled if you had your objections. That is gone. Uh, and, uh, and now it's, uh, there's a demand for conformity, and, uh, and it's quite... Uh, uh, it, it has a certain authoritarian flavor that gets my back up. I just want to ask you where you, what you think of, about what you think of President Trump uh, when it comes to women's issues and women's rights. Um, he, he's an atrocious bore uh, to women. He's also an atrocious bore to men. Um, and... Um, uh, that is one thing that uh, you know the Republicans have completely lost any credibility about because they're closing ranks behind him, right? I mean, how can they ever in future argue that any Democrat um, has uh, sacrificed uh, the moral high ground by behaving badly toward women um, when they were willing to excuse Trump? And by the way, as I said, the Democrats did that with Clinton. Um, they, they fell in line for Clinton, too. And uh, even feminists, who you would have thought would have, been, um, would have been less tolerant of his treatment of women, but no, they didn't. They, they were willing to go along because he was their guy. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's <laughs> My a, pleasure. It's a long, long journey, and thank you for telling us about it. Thanks a lot. 
that's it for this edition. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, please join us next week.